I'm David Levin, and welcome to Pop Goes the Culture, the behind the scenes and untold TV stories you probably wouldn't have known from the people who lived them. Today, we're continuing my archival conversation with Sherwood Schwartz. You may not know his name, but you know the shows he created, The Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island. Today, we finish our talk about casting Gilligan's Island. You'll learn who didn't get the part, other casting choices for that series. And you will not believe who actually tried out for the part of Marianne. Also, why the skipper was such a hard role to cast and how Alan Hale eventually landed that role. Plus, why did they switch out the professor, Marianne and Ginger from the original unaired pilot? Who are some of the other people that uh, that were up for? I know that for Ginger, there were a bunch of people. That's true. That's true, but I, 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 you tend to forget people who didn't get the part, you know, because... Well, you tell me if, I, if, if, and they're not gonna hear me, so if, I, if I'm right and I get it right, you can, you can just reflect it back to me. The, what I read was Raquel Welch and Jane Mansfield were up for the part of Ginger, is that true? Yeah, they weren't up for it, but... Uh, they tried out for it. Well, uh, Raquel Welch actually tried out for it. Raquel Welch, you want me to pick it up here? Sure. Uh, for the part of, uh, no, as a matter of fact, for the part of Mary Ann, Raquel Welch came in to test for that part. And uh, when she came in to test for the, for the role, uh, Dawn Wells, who had already tested for the role, and who I liked very much, thought that she was sunk because Raquel Welch had a big name. But I said to myself, and I said to Dawn Wells, as you got the part, because there's no way that Raquel Welch, who was gorgeous uh, and in a sexy way, could play Marianne. That was a different role. I said, we can maybe talk about her for Ginger, I said, but uh, not for, and that was a big relief for Dawn, uh, Dawn Wells. What about um, Jane Mansfield? I don't remember, I don't remember Jane, Jane Mansfield. Uh, that, if that would certainly be not for uh, the country girl, no, but certainly. certainly not for the country girl. Uh, but uh, I really, I don't, I didn't interview her in any way. Maybe somebody else did, because you don't sit in a corner by yourself. You, you have also people that. I, I would like to talk about Alan Hale for a moment, please, because the most difficult role, and I knew to, I knew going in that the most difficult role to cast would be the skipper because the requirements are almost diametrically opposed to a big, heavy guy yelling at a kid. So I knew that he had to be such a teddy bear that, and I was just not happy with anybody on East, East Coast or West Coast. And I was out with my wife at a restaurant on Santa Monica Boulevard, and this is behind what was then Fox Studio. I guess it still is Fox Studios. And so we were having dinner, and I was, she was trying to console me because we had a, a shooting date started for the pilot and I didn't have a skipper. And that was a really important part. They all, when you only have seven people forever, <laughs> every part is important, but particularly the skipper. And so we were having dinner and I was, and she was, she's a terrific lady, married to her for 64 years and she's still terrific. And she says, somebody will come along. I said, honey, we got a date in two weeks. We have to shoot this thing. And as I'm talking to her, I look across the room of this restaurant, and there's Alan Hale, who had never tested for the part, and nobody ever mentioned him to me. And I just looked at him, and I realized this is the guy. Well, I didn't know him, so I couldn't go over to talk to him. And was an, he's having dinner, and I'm having dinner. So... Us the next morning. Oh, he was in a Civil War uniform, by the way, in the restaurant. Okay. Which was north behind. South. <laughs> I don't remember. North. <laughs> <laughs> and so, since I didn't know him, I waited till the next morning and I called his agent. And I said, I want to discuss Alan Hale for the part in the pilot I'm going to be doing in about two weeks. So he said, Well, he's hard to to talk to right now because he's in St. George, Utah. I said, I just saw him last night in a restaurant. He said, well, that was last night. He said, he left at four this morning. 
I said, well, I have to get in touch with them immediately. Well, St. George, Utah is located at the bottom of a canyon. You can't even go there by car. You have to take a horse. So uh, I said, well, I have to, I would, I don't know how to tell you this, but I need him badly. He said, well, I don't care how badly you need him. He's not here. I said, well, can I get a script to him? He said, well, we can manage that. I said, if he reads it and likes it, can I get him here in two weeks to do the pilot film? He said, well, we can talk about that if he likes the script and you like him. I said, I've never met him, but I have a feeling that he's exactly right. You have to go in casting. You have to go a lot by feeling. I could turn that into a sexy joke, but I, I prefer not to because I did the Brady Bunch, and that would be unseemly. Anyway, uh, he got the script to, to, to uh, Alan Hale, and Alan Hale couldn't get out from this, this gorge unless he came up by, by horseback, which he did. I had to call CBS to see if I could hold the facilities open on a Sunday, because that's the only day you have off when you're shooting on location. You only have one day off. So I said, if we can arrange all this, and it's, it was, I knew it wasn't going to be easy, because I have to hold a facility open, have him come in on a horse from, from, from St. George, Utah. And, uh, but that's what happened. He came in, he had a buddy who, with the horse, and the two of them rode up to the free, uh, highway, freeway, I guess it is, and he took a, uh, he hitched a ride to, to Las Vegas, which was the closest place, and flew in to uh, L.A., tested for the part, which I knew was perfect, and he was perfect, and I had to get uh, Bob Denver in. That same, all this happened, you know, in, in like 48 hours, all this was going on. And he got back, went back to his horse, which was waiting by the freeway with his friend. And <laughs> <laughs> casting is sometimes very difficult. <laughs> but he was perfect, as I knew he would be. Great guy, wonderful man. Pilot, you had two other character actors in for The Professor and what was then not Marianne, but Bunny. Yeah. You want to talk about that and why, what happened to those two? Well, uh, as, as most people know, well, many people know, there were two changes in the, in the uh, original casting of... of this, this frequently happens in shows where they do a pilot and then for one reason or another uh, there's dissatisfaction with some, some role. And that, that has, that's what happened in the case of, of uh, the girl. And part of that was my own fault because I had not written the characters, I'm basically a writer, so I can blame myself, because there wasn't enough of a separation between the two ladies in the pilot film. They were both secretaries who were on a vacation. And then I realized that there's not enough separation. I needed one to be sexy and the other to be very modest. And so after the, after the pilot, I decided to change the roles to make that make them more in keeping with seven distinct people instead of two who became indistinct in the in the pilot so we changed uh, those roles and so far as the professor was concerned he looked a little too immature to have all those those degrees from 17 different colleges so we got a a more uh, well uh, the, somebody who and that was uh, of course, uh, the guy who became the professor and who went on to become, he told me this himself, he was very proud of the fact, this is uh, Russ jo Johnson. Russ Johnson was a professor and he's very proud of the fact that two years running, he got the Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, this is the truth. <laughs> in in uh, at uh, the college in, in Boston, no, no, M, MIT, where he got the Ig Nobel Prize uh, for uh, two years in a row, the first one ever to win two Ig Nobel Prizes. That's hysterical. <laughs>
Next time, we'll continue one of my favorite conversations as Sherwood Schwartz talks about Great Gilligan's Island guest stars, including Zsa Zsa Gabor, Don Rickles, Phil Silvers, Hans, Hans? Hans Conried, and a prepubescent Kurt Russell. Plus, he talks about aging. We talk about his legacy. Also, what did Sherwood Schwartz, creator of Gilligan's Island, think of Lost? That show was airing when we did this interview. We also start talking about the Brady Bunch and why he feels Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island are pretty much the same show. And then we'll reveal the true three in the morning origin of Gilligan's Island. Plus, Schwartz confesses his real feelings about networks. It's a jam-packed episode. Meanwhile, which Sherwood Schwartz series was your favorite? Gilligan? The Brady Bunch? It's about time. Let me know in the comments. And by the way, if you haven't hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode, do it now and help us out by becoming a Patreon subscriber. For just a buck a month, you'll get your name checked on at least one Pop Goes the Culture episode. That's a great way to let people think you're famous and keep us on the air. I can't wait to hear your thoughts.